on, on top of the project nerd book that, uh, um, and as Ellen said, this is, this is our, surprisingly, it's kind of shocking, our fifth session on philanthropy here at, at Synergos. And, um, and I think most of you know, I'm a, professionally, I'm a financial advisor, certified financial planner with Morgan Stanley. So I think about how the capital markets affect things like our retirement portfolios and philanthropy a lot. So thinking back five years ago, the S&P 500 closed at 1,535, 1,535. Today it closed at 1,412. That has a dramatic impact on philanthropy and investments in the social sector. Right? We need to be able to make money to invest it in the things we care about. Oh yeah, and I, and I didn't really mention, right? We had a little dip in the S&P yeah. during that time frame. <laughs> the low was, was around 680. Yeah. Let's see um, think about that. <laughs> so so we think, of, think about the, if you think about the, the, our donor base, and investment uh, pool, and the thought process when we've gone through this five years of, of no return and this big V to kind of get back to almost where we were, right? It's it, that has a tremendous impact. Um, I want to be thoughtful, so I'm going to be really specific about some some of the terms and and structures that we talk about. So. Investing for impact versus impact investing. They're, they're kind of the same words, kind of turned around a little bit, but they have extremely different meanings. And the IRS tells us so. <laughs> <laughs> so we have to believe it. <laughs> um, if you look at organizations, there's a spectrum of organizations. There are charities that are really doing really important work. Enoch Choi, um, a few years ago, was here talking about, you know, Enoch Choi, local MD, about the relief work he's doing in places like Haiti and Japan, right? That's charity work. It's important. It gets funded in a particular manner. There are nonprofits that kind of start pushing that edge up towards what might look like for-profit businesses. One of my favorites is an organization called Mercado Global started by a young woman out of, out of Yale. She, she works with artisan producers in Guatemala and helps them sell their crafts through companies like, or, or stores like Bloomingdale's, Levi's, Nordstrom's. She's, an, she's, an, she's a not-for-profit. We cross that line a little bit and you've got companies like r Block. r Block is a for-profit <coughs> company the IRS says you're a for-profit company, or VEC created the organization that way. They are not a nonprofit, and I think it was Michelle was asking about their 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 business model and how they make money. They're they're kind of on that on the IRS turn of a, of a profitable social a for-profit social venture. They are not a nonprofit. Another one that a lot of us know that are that's that's in that realm is like Reach and Teach. They're, they're a for-profit social venture. And then we've got the spectrum that continues all the way out to like somebody like Walmart. Now Walmart might be giving black, lots of money to the, to the community and things, but they're there to make money and that's their main goal. They, they keep people employed, those are all good things. So, so keep that spectrum in mind as we talk mm -hmm. about, mm -hmm. about uh, through this process tonight, there is a very definite line about whether it's a, a not-for-profit or for-profit, and it's really important because investing, financial investing, people forget. Financial investing is the most important thing to think, to remember in financial money, investing is how you get your money back out. And people forget that all the time. So as we look at and talk about these things, it's do we expect to get our money back out? It's a really critical factor to remember. So we've got Nancy Heinen. She's the, the chair of the board of SV2, mm -hmm. as Ellen was saying. She's the former general counsel mm -hmm. of Apple. Mm -hmm. So she is really well positioned to talk about how Silicon Valley gives back. Um, so Nancy, uh, how did you end up as, as, as the general counsel and, and a key member of the Apple turnaround team? Because you went there in what, 97? I did. 
And, and, what, and, and what does the CFO tell you your first day at? at Welcome aboard, we're in a death spiral. <laughs> <laughs> you know that, of course. <laughs> Not exactly. <laughs> that wasn't what Thank Steve Jobs said. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that was the first day. <laughs> so tell us a little bit about your background. Sure, yeah. So I am from the Bay Area, not originally. I was born in Minnesota, but I grew up um, in the Mid Peninsula in San Carlos. One of six kids, highly competitive family. I have four older sisters beating the out of me on a regular basis. Um, I then stayed in the Bay Area for college. I went to the University of California at Berkeley. Yay. I know Yay. I'm yeah, yeah. <laughs> Stanford land, but I am a bear. Um, and while I was there, um, I, I loved being at a large public university. That was probably the greatest thing um, for my educational experience. Uh, but while I was there, my oldest sister got very ill. She um, was ill with pancreatic cancer. And so the last year of my college, I was spending time, I was working because I was um, supporting myself through college and helping take care of my sister because my parents were, were really struggling with, um, with her. She came home to, to be here. Uh, and that's a very impactful thing when you're 19, I think I just turned 20 when she passed away, um, to sort of say, what is the future of your life? You know, what, what is it when you can't really count on having a future necessarily, when something, an illness or some other accident can take it away? And I really had a lot of trouble kind of absorbing that into things. So I was going to do the great walkabout in Europe and kind of clear my head before I figured out what was next. I was a um, English literature and psychology major which even at that time was not the most marketable degree uh, given uh, environment. So I went over to Europe and I wound up staying a couple of years because I loved exploring the world. I loved finding different cultures, different people, engaging in different experiences and just surrounding yourself with other ways of thinking. Um, but after a couple of years of that I had really exciting jobs like Spraying perfume on people at parents' <laughs> department school. <laughs> Working as a barmaid in Sloan Square. Um, there were a few more interesting, but I did go back to the United States. There were probably States. a few steps between that and general <laughs> counsel. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. But it was not a clear trajectory. <laughs> so it occurred to me two years out of university, I really probably needed to do something more substantive. So I did come back to Berkeley for law school. Um, and then came out of law school looking to really be in, involved in the community here. I spent my third year at Harvard Law School and um, great experience there, but really uh, interesting. Probably felt more foreign in Cambridge than I think I did in Guangzhou, China in 1979. <laughs> it was just, I needed to be back in the Bay Area. So I started working with small companies, with entrepreneurs, in a very small firm that was very entrepreneurially uh, structured and stayed in private practice for uh, about seven years and then my little firm that was really fun merged with a really great big firm and that was not as much fun or interesting <laughs> and I um, took that opportunity to decide to go in-house as counsel at a company called Tandem Computers and Tandem was right down the road from this other icon called Apple and Tandem had the beer busts and they were an enterprise company whereas Apple was on the more consumer oriented time of, at, at the time um, and had a great experience rotating through a number of different areas, learning manufacturing, learning sales and marketing, learning the operations, running all their subsidiaries, working with a really incredible board of directors, really great experience, but Tandem was really struggling. Um, and the layoffs and the right sizing and the downsizing and all of that became really, really um, tiring. And so I was just sort of thinking, well, what else would I do? And it turns out there was another computer company that had failed miserably in hardware called <laughs> Next. <laughs> <laughs> so it turned out they were trying to be reborn from the ashes of failing as a hardware company, as a software company. Mm -hmm. And so Steve Jobs recruited me to be the general counsel of Next. And then in the irony of all ironies, three years later, we sold Next to Apple. And the prodigal son, as they kept calling it, did not return right away. He went off to this other company he was CEO of called Pixar. Mm. And he was running what's probably the most successful animation studio in history. Uh, and I was trying to figure out what was next for me. And about six months later, he was at Apple. And seven and a half months later, I was at Apple. 
because he told me he had a strategy, and the strategy was to get the, the computer company reinvigorated, to make compelling computers that we would re-enter the spaces like the teachers, like education. They were hanging on, but just their fingernails were on the ledge because they just hadn't had products that were compelling before, and we were going to re-enter the consumer space. And he also had a pitch, because Steve was the greatest marketing person in the planet. And hmm. the pitch was, you know, here's our strategy, here's where we're going with the products. We're going to know in a year if it's going to work. If it doesn't work, we're not to blame because we didn't screw it up. <laughs> <laughs> and if it does work, we'll make history. So would you give me a year? So I did. And we did make history, and we turned it around. And while I was there, we created the world's fastest growing retail chain. So I got to learn how to create an entire retail chain that um, really just created an entire new experience around retail. We really reinvented digital entertainment and made a lot of great new, um, made kids actually pay for digital downloads, which was a, a groundbreaking because this was in the era of Napster and everything on the internet had to be free and we had to create a model that was gonna be compelling enough that people would pay for content online. And then we created, got the Mac business back to incredible strength. So we did the Mac business, we did retail, we did music, and that was a lot. So after nine years, I was tired. <laughs> and we um, had two kids who were teenagers, come becoming teenagers, and I had a very wise friend tell me when they were young, and I was sort of angsting as a parent, they're gonna need you more and want you less when they're teenagers. Because <laughs> when they're teenagers, you have to be there when they wanna lean in. It's not when you happen to come home from your last trip to Japan. So I took the opportunity to go home and check in with the family. Um, my kids were just starting at uh, Sacred Heart Prep and McCord Madera School. And then started kind of moving around. And that's how I moved into the next phase. So I, so I think your, your background clearly qualifies you to be a spokesperson for Silicon Valley. <laughs> I've seen clearly. the ups, the downs, the yeah. smalls, the large. I have managed hundreds of employees. And but we can't, we, can't let you off, we can't let you off without asking this question, or, yeah. or asking you to tell us a, 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 your favorite Steve Jobs story, or at least giving us the look. Oh, his one? Yeah. <laughs> Stare. <laughs> really? That's the best you could do? <laughs> so moving on. <laughs> so, so, so SV2 is, uh, yeah, moving on to the topic. Of, so I go again, right? That, We're done that, with Steve most imitations for the night. <laughs> we, we might ask you later. Okay. Maybe a few after a few more glasses of wine. There you go. <laughs> uh, so, so I think you you called SB two a, a strategic venture philanthropic fund. Right. So, so, so how did it start, and what is a, a strategic philanthropic th fund? Yes. Okay. So SB two started uh, about fifteen years ago, and the founders Laura Ariaga Andreessen, uh, and she was a graduate student at Stanford trying to figure out with the internet coming in, her husband is Mark Andreessen, who pretty much founded web, you know, Mozilla, the web browser, Netscape. Um, but how are you gonna bring these incredible tools into philanthropy? What was going on? How could you connect other people? How could you bring the new models that were coming to play in the for-profit world into creating greater communities around giving? And I think she also observed what we have is that people want to be more engaged, that the engagement in what you're doing is the thing that makes the difference between writing a check and, and passionately carrying something forward. And so she founded SB2 in what we consider the venture capital model. And the reason it's that model is it involves not just capital, but advising. So much as the venture capitalists will fund a small company, they also take board seats, they help them with their strategic planning, they help them figure out what their revenue model should be, is there a fee for service available? They take them through the business rigor that allows them to become a great organization. So that model has been applied in the social sector where you aren't necessarily getting a return on your investment, mm -hmm. but you are getting a greater return in the social impact of the causes that you're funding. So we do make grants. We are a grant-making organization. So SV2 is a, SV2 non, is a, is a nonprofit. It's a nonprofit, and what we do is we accumulate the partners each year. They have $5,000 that they contribute to the partnership, 
and from that we make three grants each year in three different areas, education, the environment, and international development, and we actually are this year adding health because there is so much innovation, so much need because our healthcare system is not working as any of us desire or intend, and there's a lot of solutions that are being proposed, so we're gonna bring some of our energy, money, and talent to healthcare now. So education. Mm -hmm. In the Santa Clara and San Mateo counties. Environment. Environment, local. Uh, um, international development. International development and health. And health. Yeah. Uh, health so in the US, health locally. Yeah, I think we'll be looking, we are just kicked it off last defined. week. It's to be defined, yeah. but we too. Are being defined. Be being defined, yeah. Because we have this in, engaged, um, advising model, we work with organizations that are based here because we have a three-year period in which our grants are given out over three years mm -hmm. and our advising teams are formed and advise them over a three-year period. And much like the VCs, our goal at the end is they are sustainable. They've figured out how to, how to get enough capital on the, on the financial side to keep running and that they're able to then scale and reach the bigger impact that they want. So we really build our capacity. So I know one of the big kind of allures of SV2 to you was really about this building capacity and building great organizations. Yes. Yeah. And so I think yeah. that's where the, the venture part of this yes. comes in, right? Yes. That, it, that the, it's that, that helping to build that yes. sustainable it's infrastructure. Very much engaged. And the partners at SV2 come generally from the for-profit world. We have marketing experts and biotech people, and we have financial people, and we have people who come together and they find a great leverage in the money part, pooling the money, but also pooling the talent, so that we can form an advising team. And if they need to get, you know, good on their uh, good guidance on their legal side, we can provide that. But most of them need marketing help. How do we get our message out there? So we have some great marketing partners that will come in and help them figure that out. And so you really are building a great organization that happens to be a nonprofit. So, so say more about the grant making process. And we'll start a little bit earlier, sure. like in the application process. Well, we actually don't accept applications. That's the first thing. We go and find them uh, because we want to be partner-led. Our second mission, besides the grant making and helping the organizations, is really to help people who are giving become more mindful, more strategic, and more collaborative in their giving. So we try and provide an on-ramp. Wherever someone is in their giving path or trajectory, we try and find opportunities for them to learn about what's going on on a, on a subject matter or on a skill base. Do they want to learn how to be a good board member on a nonprofit? Do they want to learn how to help with strategic planning? We provide a lot of education and a lot of experiential um, uh, opportunities for them to really become deeper. So we do let the partners lead the grant making in that they will find their affinity. Um, and, and some people are very happy just writing the check knowing that there's so much really smart people who are, who are really striving for impact with their money. So some people, that's, and, and, and people vary in their cycles of available time. Sometimes people are just too busy. You know, their kids are busy or their life is just really busy. And other people really want to dig deep into the grant making. And so they might say, uh, environment is a particular passion of theirs. So they will pull together at the kickoff of a, of a year, we're on a year cycle, and they will say, what are we most interested in? What, what's, what do we want to learn about? And then they will bring in experts in that and start to figure out how they want to focus their grant making down for that particular year. So some of the partners are involved because they know you're good, you'll be a good steward of their, yeah. their funds. Yeah. Yeah. And especially since there are people like you that are coming out as out of the business side of Silicon right. Valley. Right. Um, uh, the Wall Street Journal last month published a, uh, an article and, and the title was Why Can't We Sell Charity Like We Sell Perfume? Mm. <laughs> and they touched on things like uh, that, that nonprofits were at a disadvantage because of things like compensation mm -hmm. and advertising and marketing. There, there were five things. They said that, that nonprofits were on the, on the the, uh, on the line to hit a home run every time mm -hmm. and to work in immediate time frames and, and that they were at a disadvantage because they don't, can't provide a financial return and didn't have access to capital markets. I know this is an interesting article for you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, 
I, I just I didn't even remember the title when I first mentioned it to you, and and I knew yeah. it had an immediate interaction. So, what are your thoughts around some of the things that they were talking about in this article, and how we? Well, find there's it? a couple of levers you can do to make great change. You have human capital, and you have financial capital. And if you're investing in a for-profit company, or if you're doing even impact investing, there's an ROI you can calculate. You know, we calculate how many iPods, iPhones, iPads, Macs every quarter. You know, how many downloads did you have on the App Store? There are things that don't exist in the social sector necessarily. In education, you try and get measurement, um, but you also have this human capital. And I think I have a personal. I think the number one thing you can do in an organization have A players got to get the best people you can on the team and there tends to be a there can be a view that people should because they have these passion filled jobs they shouldn't get paid for them and a lot of that gets driven by the ratio that people will say um, see between money spent on programs and money spent on overhead and I think there needs to be more metrics than just a program versus overhead and seeing whether you're getting the impact you need. If you bring in an incredible marketing person who can make you be more successful in reaching more donors, in getting your message out and getting more impact, that person deserves a living wage. And sometimes, especially in the Bay Area, they don't even, you know, it's very hard to justify that. So, and this is a personal view that others have espoused, and I think this article in the Wall Street Journal said, why do we punish people who want to go into nonprofits? You have them, their tenure becomes so short because they need to live at some point. They can't get a living wage practically. And, and I think there should be some rethinking about, is this organization having the social impact it is targeted. Is it moving the needle? And if it's moving the needle, then the human capital deserves to be supported at a certain ratio, as well as making greater access to some of the financial levers. So it really, um, it struck a chord with me because you hear, well, they shouldn't be paid more because they get to, you know, work for nothing. <laughs> you know, because they have these passion-filled jobs. I'm like, I had a passion-filled job at Apple and I got paid pretty well. <laughs> So uh, it's not to say that you need to, you can you can't take the same models because one you know there's necessarily but I think the mindset around building these great organizations lends you to say am I attracting the right people am I going to keep the right people because I'm giving them a fair wage yeah so I, so I, I and I and I would agree I would say you know that that my my expensive donated dollars are the ones that don't move the needle what's well, moving the needle. Yeah, and so, that's where you need to focus. Yes, are you are you having impact? Yeah, nobody wants to see some of these. I mean, there've been scandals in the past of some of these very large organizations that are just excessive compensation, and that's not what I'm talking about at all. I'm talking about you know, if you're moving the needle, then you definitely. And, and in the valley, you see lean startups. I mean, these these nonprofits tend to run pretty darn lean. They're they're taking the pencils back from every meeting. You know, they're <laughs> using the back of paper. I mean, these guys. Are, I don't, I don't see in the, in the organizations we work with, they don't, they are in that early stage and they, they are very mindful of, of shepherding their resources very well. So what advice would you have for people in this, in this room that want to improve the impact they're having in their projects? I think um, there's a few things you, you need to do. One is figure out what do you care most about and how do you want to be involved? And for some people, it's fine to identify great organizations and say, I'm going to cheer them on. That's great. And there is nothing wrong with that because we need a lot of that. Is the, the problems are so complex. And the solutions, there's a lot of great solutions, but there's so much less resources. I mean, the, the government isn't going to come through on a lot of this. A lot of the resources, um, I mean, Jeff just pointed out where people are and they're giving. And it's, it's a challenge. It's a big challenge to find adequate. So are you finding the things that you care about? Are you willing, and do you have the time to go deep into whether something is working and, and how are you going to know it's working? So can you take the time to learn about how do you measure outcomes? How do you know if this is really having the impact? That's one of the things we like to do at SB2 is help people learn how do you measure and evaluate social return? Because it's, it's not as easy as how many iPods did you ship and what's your gross margin? Mm -hmm. Yeah, dollars are easy to count. Dollars are easier to count, yeah. yeah. So, so, so how would somebody in this room become involved in SB2? So SB2, we'd love to have people and, come and to I'll, our and meetings. I'll, and I'll, and I'll re-interpret yeah. re that question for you. you yeah. can, how can we help you? 
Well, we'd love to have people come try us out and just see what we're about. We send out email, all sorts of events. We have grant rounds. We do a first Friday that's just um, an educational event on the topic of interest. We'd love to have people just get on our email newsletter and see if they're interested in popping in. We have a fall meeting where I met Jeff. We have a spring meeting. Um, we try and bring in really thought leaders in different uh, the areas we, we focus on that are really telling us what's what's new, what's happening, what's what's kind of the exciting things that are going on and what maybe isn't working so well. Um, so we just try and create a very open environment in which people can come in and if they like the model and they like the partners, then they can join. So it's sb2.org? sb2.org. It is.